Rifaim in the Middle East For a thousand years, Transjordan remained relatively uninhabited because of the contamination of the dead. The Rifaim settled the lands westward because of this reason. The poisoned land may have taken that long to recover and for the native population to forget about the Holocaust. A year before the invasion of Canaan in 2086, Abraham returned to Canaan suddenly after a short stay in Egypt in 2092 BC. Abraham pursued the departing invasion army with the help of Eshkol, Aner and Mamre, the Anarchim generals, who are identified in the book of Joshua as Anarchim. Abraham split his forces at Bethel and Lot took part of the army to Sidim while Abraham retired to the area south of Mamre in Hebron. During the exodus, the Israelite spies came to Hebron, which they said was inhabited by Ahimon, Shishai, and Talmai, all known as the children of Anak. Nephilim were described as sons of extraordinary power and stature. Anak's sons appear nowhere else in the Old Testament because they are not Semites. There is, however, one king named Shishai listed among the Hyksos kings who ruled Egypt. The Hebrew scriptures vilify the Anakim just as they do the Amalekites. Following their flight from Egypt, the Israelites were prevented from entering Canaan directly by the Amalekites. After forty years in Canaan, the Israelites were told that the Anakim had been exterminated from Judah and Israel, according to Joshua 11. The people of Anak were wiped out by Joshua at the time, from the highlands, from Hebron, from Debir, from all of Israel and all of Judah. They and their towns were destroyed by Joshua, leaving none of the Anak people in the land of Bene Israel. They were only left in Gaza, Gath and Ashdod. The claim was somewhat premature, however, for during the next 400 years, the period equated to that of the judges, the Anakim and their Amalekite and Philistine allies controlled and ruled the land and caused the Hebrew tribes much difficulty. No reason is given for such a blank policy towards the people of Anak, and the excoriation is strongly similar to the curse against the Amalekites. The Anakim appear to have blocked the Israelites' occupation mainly in the West's mountainous regions. These were the citadels of the Philistines. According to biblical tradition, five fortified cities in the Philistines' land dominated the surrounding lands as far as Beersheba and Debir. In the ensuing period, their chariots bursting forth from their citadels provided continual harassment to the tribes of Israel, especially Ashdod, Ekron, Gath, Gaza and Ashkelon, which stood firm against all Israelite efforts to dislodge them after the exodus. Joshua 11 refers to these Philistines as Anakim. Jeremiah 47 refers to them as remnants of the Anakim. What were these Philistines supposed to be? The book of Amos contains an interesting reference that the deity brought the ancestors of the Philistines from Crete to Canaan, just as he brought the Israelites out of Egypt. According to Genesis 10, the Philistines were descendants of Kaphtorim, who displaced the native Avim in coastal areas. In this sense, they appear to be chosen people. These Cretans intermarried with the Rephaim, producing a race of fierce warriors who came to be known as Philistines to the Hebrews. Their territory overlapped with that of the Amalekites in the south and Anakites in the west. At the time, the scriptures seemed to confuse the names of these three groups of people. The Philistines were also related to, or at least allied with, the people of the northern coastal cities, later known as Phoenicia. This is indicated in Jeremiah 47, when he prophesies the fate of the Philistines. Occasionally, Abraham and Isaac halted in the western lands to offer sacrifices, communicate with Yahweh, and receive further instructions. Before the Hebrews arrived, the native population considered certain places sacred, including Sheshem and Bethel. These were the privileged few, the aristocracy, who had access to field stations or regional transmitters. Mesopotamian reed huts are frequently depicted in paintings and engravings on cylinder seals and pottery. 
Probably this was Utnapishtim's reed hut when the deluge was announced to him. Enki, the creator and benefactor of man, was the only god who remained sympathetic to him when the gods decided to unleash the deluge on humanity due to his foibles. Forewarning Utnapishtim was Enki's way of preventing his creation from being destroyed. The epic begins with Enki speaking to the reed hut's wall. The reed wall, the reed wall, reed wall, listen. Reed wall, pay attention. Shurupak, son of Ubaratutu, tore down the house, build an ark. Scholars have been baffled why God would speak to a reed hut wall to deliver information to Sumerian Noah. There was just no rustic reed hut about this house. It would make sense for Enki to be in the orbiting spaceship where the gods just met in council to decide man's fate at this time. Utnapishtim likely listened to the broadcast from his home city of Shurupak in Mesopotamia, where he inhabited a reed hut or had a radio receiver. Throughout Mesopotamia and its neighboring lands, reed huts are depicted on numerous cylinder seals and paintings. They all have antenna-like projections on their roofs, with round eye-like objects attached. These reed huts, or radio stations, were likely associated with the goddess Ishtar, whose symbols evolved into gateposts with streamers. These reed huts could also be moved from place to place as depicted on a cylinder seal depicting one being transported by boat. A portable radio station was built by Moses to contact Yahweh during the Exodus. Moses and the Israelites needed a way to communicate with Yahweh during Exodus. As soon as they had been soundly defeated at Rephidim and retreated to Mount Sinai and Kadesh to regroup under Jethro, it was decided they would have to take a longer and more indirect route around Canaan since they could not enter via the direct route. When the deity was not present in the tent of meeting, the Israelites needed a way to communicate. According to Yahweh, Adad, Yahweh, would stay at Mount Sinai and direct Moses from there. The Ark of the Covenant was built according to Moses' instructions and schematic drawings. As Yahweh instructed Moses on Mount Sinai, Note well and follow the patterns for them that are being shown to you. Moses built the Ark based on those drawings. Acacia wood and gold plating were used to make the box. There was a cherub at each end of the solid gold cover. Solid gold was an excellent choice because it conducts electricity well. The cherubs and cover were made in one piece to ensure good electrical contact. In reality, the cover was the device's key. Having their wings outstretched, the cherubim shielded the cover with their wings, thus forming an antenna. Since Moses and his associates were Egyptians, this cherub must have looked like a winged sphinx, given their Egyptian origins. After depositing the tablets provided by Adad, the cover was placed on the box. The tablets were only presented to Moses after the ark had been built. In addition to containing the power source needed to activate the receiver transmitter, the tablets probably formed an integral part of the device. It is then told to Moses, From above the Ark of the Pact, between the two cherubim that are on top, I will share with you. Throughout the next 38 years, they communicated this way. The voice addressed Moses from above the cover of the Ark of the Pact between the two cherubim, according to number 7. Inscribed with the Ten Commandments were two stone tablets that contained the power source and transmission device. The whole purpose of the Ark was defeated when Moses broke the first set of tablets upon descending Mount Sinai due to his anger at seeing the Israelites worshipping a golden calf. A second set had to be fashioned for Moses. He may have spent 40 days there because a second set or replacement parts took too long to fabricate. Since the ark was inherently dangerous, only Moses, Aaron, and his two sons were allowed to approach it. As a result of an accident, Aaron's two sons died. According to Leviticus, fire came forth from the Lord and consumed them. Thus they died before the Lord. As a result of the sudden and unexpected electricity discharge from the ark, 
Nevertheless, the Old Testament does not tell the whole story of this event, so we must consult the Hebrew oral tradition for additional information. As described in the Haggadah, two flames of fire erupted from the Holy of Holies like threads, then parted into four and both pierced Nadab's and Abihu's nostrils, burning their souls, although no external injury was visible. Those who dared enter the tent to serve the deity were threatened severely by this apparent electrical discharge. To prevent further casualties, Moses was told by Leviticus to warn Aaron, Tell your brother Aaron that he must not come at will into the shrine behind the curtain in front of the cover on the ark, for he may die. In this statement, it is clear that the Ark of the Covenant is more dangerous than anything else in the Tent of Meeting, including the deity's vehicle or kabod. In light of the inherent dangers of the Ark, it was decided to train a group of priests, the tribe of Levi, to handle all Ark-related matters. A fixed, clearly defined group of initiates was allowed access to the Ark from that point on, wearing protective clothing and following proper safety procedures. These garments are made according to instructions that leave no room for error, which indicates that their protective nature was woven into the fabric. Levites must have approached the ark with trepidation and a fear of not returning alive to the tent due to its extreme danger. Israelites kept the ark safe in the tent of meeting. During travel, the Levites carried the ark ahead of the people. Two thousand cubits shall separate you from it. Joshua 3 states. 2,000 cubits are roughly one kilometer and are considered a safety buffer zone. Numbers recounts how the destructive power of the Ark annihilated 250 members of the tribe of Korah. As the Israelites rested near Kadesh after their second and final defeat in Canaan, 250 members of the tribe of Korah were ordered to appear at the entrance of the Tent of Meeting. Incense offerings were consumed by a fire suddenly appearing from the Lord. Ironically, copper pans, which had attracted the discharge, were hammered into sheets and used as altar plating, despite the victims appearing to be completely incinerated. According to the Haggadah, they may have been eliminated for showing cowardice in this battle, since the incident occurred immediately after their second defeat at Horma. There is also evidence that the Ark emits dangerous radioactivity. Numbers 10 tells of Marian, Moses' sister, being stricken with scales at the tent's entrance, a condition very similar to radioactive poisoning. The radioactive nature of the instrument was confirmed by subsequent associations with the Ark. A few years after the Exodus, the Ark was captured and brought by the Philistines to their cities in western Palestine after the tribes had settled in Canaan. Philistines suffered plagues during the seven months described in the first book of Samuel. Too close contact with the Ark caused sores, tumors, and hair loss, classic symptoms of radioactivity poisoning. As a result of their curiosity, 70 local residents approached the Ark and were killed. Eventually, they abandoned it at kiriath Jean and returned it to the nearest Israelite community, passing it from Philistine to Philistine. David returned the Ark to Jerusalem much later, after it had acquired a deadly reputation due to its dangers. As the Ark was toppling from the wagon, one of the men attempted to steady it. As a result of a discharge from the Ark, he was killed outright. In the days that followed, the Ark remained inactive, probably because this last discharge neutralized the power source. Mesopotamian kings kept in touch with their home city and received instructions from the gods while away from it, usually on one of their numerous military expeditions. These statues or images of the gods were taken to serve this purpose. There was a belief that these statuettes were the active residences of the deities. In terms of size and composition, they varied. In her definitive work, Babylon, Joan Oates states that these statues were fashioned and repaired in special workshops in the city and had to undergo a highly secret ritual of consecration that gave them life and enabled them to speak. They were carried off to war by kings and priests. 
The statuette probably contained a radio receiver, transmitter, and power source in this ritual. The statuettes are believed to have been made by Abraham and his father Terah in a workshop they operated. Even though Genesis does not mention this activity, it is extensively discussed. Pseudepigrapha, the priesthood of Ur, the elite class that ruled the city, described Terah and Abraham. Abraham was descended from a family of high priests according to Jubilees. He, Terah, grew up and lived among the Chaldeans, and his father taught him the researches of the Chaldeans in order to practice divination and astrology based on the signs of the heavens. It was said of his father, Terah. Western scholars did not gain access to the Apocalypse of Abraham until the late Middle Ages, a 1st century AD document transmitted in Slavonic through Byzantine channels. Abraham's early days are described in great detail in this book. According to this account, Abraham's father was an astrologer and idol-maker. For ordinary citizens and travelers, he manufactured temple idols. These idols had different values and qualities, whether made of stone, wood, iron, copper, silver, or gold. It was Abraham's duty to sell some of these statuettes to merchants from Egypt at a stall just outside town. After Abraham and his father had a falling out over these idols, providentially lightning struck Terah's workshop and caught fire. In their possession, when Terah and Abraham left for Haran and Canaan, they probably had a number of these idols, statuettes with embedded devices or power packs. According to Old Testament accounts, these were probably portable communicators called teraphim. The cult statues found at Tepe Gaura in Upper Mesopotamia date back to about 3000 BC. Sumerian animated idols are similar to cult objects. Probably crystal-like power packs were inserted into the recessed eye sockets of these large-eyed pagan idols or portable statuettes to activate the communicators. There has been a description of these power packs as stones, apparently an ancient word for crystals of a large size. Ezekiel 21, Zechariah 10, and Judges 17 and 18 mention teraphim, figurines, or idols of different sizes used for divination. According to the biblical account, teraphim answered questions posed to them. Teraphim's meaning and etymology are unclear. According to the Encyclopedia Judaica, it may come from the Hittite word tapis, which means animated spirit. This is probably true due to the Hittite influence in Canaan. There is a significant role played by the Teraph in Abraham's life. Through Isaac and Joseph, then to Egypt, where they presumably fell under the control of Moses, its use can be traced back a thousand years. Joshua and Kenaz refer to the Teraphim again. They were considered merely pagan relics or curiosities by this time about 1400 BC. The teraphim were apparently used to communicate with the deity from the days of Abraham until Moses and before the Ark of the Covenant. During the days of the invasion of the Eastern Kings, El Shaddai or Adad directed Abraham to go to Canaan and Egypt. In the case of Rachel, the teraphim were small enough to hide under a saddle, while in the case of David, they were large enough to fool the assassins sent by Saul. Genesis 35 mentions the teraphim when Rachel attempts to steal her father's idols. Before Abraham left for the western lands, he may have gathered these items with his cousin Laban at Haran. Abraham must have explained to Jacob the significance of these idols before he died. Laban may have also guessed their purpose from the lengths he went to to retrieve them, although he obviously didn't know how to use them given the value Jacob and Rachel placed on them. Based on the calculations below, we can see that this is true. In 1992 BC, Abraham was 175 years old. In 2007, Isaac was 60 years old when Jacob was born to him. When Abraham died, Jacob was 15 years old. Abraham had ample time to inform his grandson Jacob of these devices' existence and import 
and their storage at Haran. As a result of Jacob's sojourn at Haran, he probably returned the devices to Abraham's family after obtaining them. The teraphim were obviously hidden by Rachel, and Jacob may not have found out where they were after all these years of suffering at the hands of Laban. It reads like a fiction story, just as Genesis did. For twenty years, Laban compelled Jacob to serve him under various pretexts. As a result, Jacob and Rachel secretly took Laban's idols, or teraphim, while Laban was absent. Laban made a big deal out of these idols after he realized Jacob had left. Finally, he caught up with the fleeing criminal. Jacob left secretly because he was homesick for his father's house, but Laban was more concerned with the theft of his idols. You had to leave because you were homesick, but why did you steal my gods? He complained. Although only this one teraphim was mentioned in the account, there must have been many more. Only those mentioned in the account were hidden by Rachel in a camel cushion while she sat on it. Amid her monthly cycle, she pleaded that Laban does not disturb her. The teraphim were nowhere to be found during Laban's search. Jacob must have had many more teraphim in his possession, which somehow he managed to conceal from Laban's prying eyes. As Jacob and his household headed back to Canaan, they stopped at Sheshem, a sacred site for the indigenous people. All the alien gods they had acquired at Haran were ordered to be placed at Sheshem. Many of these likely were buried at Sheshem's terebinth, Oak. Jacob was concerned that no one else would be permitted to bring one home despite keeping him. The use and control of the device were tightly guarded secrets. Only he and Rachel knew what the teraphim were for. Whatever the reason, the cache of statuettes and their power packs remained buried at Sheshem until Kenaz's time. The followers of Kenaz, the successor to Joshua, discovered these idols and their stones or power packs many years later. Jacob probably brought along communication devices when he went to Egypt at 130 in 1877 BC, and Moses acquired them several hundred years later. He probably used one to contact Yahweh or Adad when he visited Mount Sinai for the first time. It is called the Biblical Antiquities of Pseudo-Philo because its attribution to Philo of Alexandria in the 1st century AD is in question. Philo describes how the tribe sought a leader after Joshua died because they were hard-pressed by the Philistines. The document describes what happened after Joshua died and defines leadership succession through Kenaz, Zebul, and Deborah. In his first speech, Kenaz questioned each tribe's sinful behavior, believing they had strayed from the Mosaic law. Among the confessions, the one that caught our attention most is that of the tribe of Asher, which confessed, I have found the seven golden idols that the Amorites call sacred nymphs, and we have hidden them with their precious stones under the summit of Mount Sheshem. Send, and you will find them. As soon as Kenaz found them, he had them removed, and they were brought to him. Stones with crystal and praise colors, clear and light green, were described. He was told that these were the precious stones that the Amorites kept in their sanctuaries, whose value could not be estimated. These crystals, which had been attached to the idols, were also light-emitting. A lamp was not needed for those entering by night, as the stones glowed brightly. The crystals were embedded in the hollow eye sockets of the Amorites, Canaanites' idols. Hebrews probably did not know what crystals were used for other than adornments on pagan idols. There is a truism that what is not understood is feared and destroyed. Kenaz, however, discovered that these stones or crystals were virtually indestructible. Initially, he attempted to extinguish the flames with fire, but it only extinguished them. After that, he attempted to split them with an iron sword, but they only dented the blade. According to Philo, a mysterious angel removed them during the night in desperation after they had been offered on an altar to the deity in desperation. A cache of idols found under an oak at Sheshem contained these Kenaz crystals, 
which emitted light and were virtually indestructible. Jacob's household probably buried them several hundred years ago. Even after all this time, the crystals still emitted light and were active. Stones alone were not very useful since they activated devices like teraphims, portable radio receivers, and transmitters. Kenaz, in the late 15th century BC, at the start of the quiet period known as the Days of the Judges, had reduced the stones to mere curiosities. They were considered pagan artifacts because they were associated with native Canaanite idols. According to the Haggadah, a precious stone illuminated the ark, making the night appear like day inside the ship. A lamp was not required as Kenaz's crystals shine brightly at night. During the 150 days Noah was at sea, a power pack like this was probably used to illuminate the ark. Latter-day Saints' holy book, the Book of Mormon, mentions a similar power source. For their journey to the Promised Land, the tribe of Lehi built eight ships about 600 BC. During the 344 days they were at sea, and before they finally reached shore, sixteen small stones, two for each vessel, which was white and clear, transparent as glass, were given to the vessels to see in the darkened interiors. They glowed forth in the darkness during the 344 days they were at sea. Cuneiform records of Mesopotamia mention Dilmun more than any other place. It is probably second only to Atlantis in many books written about this land of mystery. Unlike Atlantis, Dilmun was well documented, which confirms that it was a Middle Eastern location. A land intimately associated with Sumer and Akkad, Dilmun provided its cities with many economic necessities through tribute or trade, just as Meluha, Africa, and Magan, Egypt did. Dilmun was also called the land of the living, that is, the land of immortality, as well as a sacred or holy land, a kind of Garden of Eden. Scholars disagree about the location of Dilmun, despite references to it in the Mesopotamian literature and myth. Dilmun was mentioned in economical texts as early as the 24th century BC, and as late as the 1st millennium BC, so it wasn't just literary fiction. According to recent theories, the island is believed to be Bahrain in the Persian Gulf. According to Geoffrey Bibby's study looking for Dilmun, this is the case. Sargon of Assyria asserted in his inscription circa 720 BC that among the kings paying him tribute were Uperi, king of Dilmun, whose abode is situated like a fish in the midst of the sea where the sun rises. Despite the discrepancy concerning the sunrise, Sargon has been interpreted to mean that Dilmun was an island and the Persian Gulf was the sea. According to Samuel Noah Kramer's book, The Sumerians, it is located where the sun rises towards the east of Sumer, so it would be within the Indus River Valley. In this theory, the Sumerian Noah is said to have been given immortality and transplanted to the place where the sun rises and the mouth of rivers. It seems that Dilmun's geographical location is determined by the statement that it was in the west toward the rising sun in both instances. The Sinai Peninsula is identified as the land of Dilmun, Tilmun, in Zechariah Sitchin's book, The Stairway to Heaven. There are several reasons why locating the land of Dilmun is challenging, including arbitrary interpretations of Sumerian and Akkadian texts. Gilgamesh's travel accounts provide essential information about this land. In this regard, two epics are often mentioned. The famous Gilgamesh epic, which is on twelve cuneiform tablets, and Gilgamesh and the Land of the Living, a lesser known but complete poem. On a religious or spiritual level, Dilmun was regarded as a blessed paradise by the Sumerians. Enki and Nikosag's myth describes Dilmun as a bright, clear and pure land called the Land of the Living, free of illness and death. It is therefore the Land of Immortality that is Dilmun. A divine garden, green with fruit-laden fields and meadows, is created by Enki, who orders Utu to bring up fresh water from the ground, eaten on earth. In the myth of Gilgamesh and the land of the living, the land of the living is not mentioned by name, 
but clearly refers to the land where no one died or got sick. Gilgamesh sets out for a distant land to fall, brings back some of its cedar trees, and makes a name for himself. Gilgamesh must get permission and support from Utu struck Shamash, his friend and co-adventurer. A mechanical device that guards the cedar land against intruders appears to be Humbaba, sometimes called Huwawa, in Gilgamesh and the Land of the Living. There is no mention of Dilmun in Gilgamesh's journey, but it is a paradise land, a land of cedars, and land controlled by Utu or Shamash. He also travels to a distant cedar land in hopes of achieving immortality in the Gilgamesh epic. He encounters and destroys the monster Humbaba, who protects the cedar forest. The roaring of Humbaba is like that of a storm, and his mouth is like fire and death. Two epics involving Gilgamesh's adventures to a distant cedar land under Utu's or Shamash's control and guarded by a mechanical monster appear to be related. The Gilgamesh epic, which consists of twelve cuneiform tablets, is known for its disjointed narrative. Most translations follow the traditional twelve-tablet format of the Semitic Akkadian version written in the Middle Babylonian period around the 13th century BC. There are also fragments of this epic in other languages, such as Old Babylonian Semitic, Hittite or Northwestern Semitic, and the original Sumerian. In the 3rd millennium BC, Gilgamesh's exploits were well known throughout the Middle East thanks to the fragments dated as far back as 2000 BC. When the Middle Babylonians produced their version of the Gilgamesh epic, other versions of the epic and stories about the exploits of this legendary king were available in Sumerian and Akkadian literary forms. It is reasonable to assume that these Semitic Babylonians considered themselves the bearers of Sumerian culture and civilization and they combined the contemporary texts into one continuous narrative which developed over time. Many Gilgamesh stories are compiled in it, as is evident from its structure. The first tablet describes Gilgamesh's birth, deeds and friendship with Enkidu. Tablet 2 continues this association as they continue their journey to the cedar forest guarded by Humbaba. Humbaba is then slain by them, the land under Shamash's control is entered with permission from Tablet 3. As a result, Gilgamesh dreams of what appears to be a rocket launch in Tablets 4 and 5. There appears to be no connection between Tablet 6 and Gilgamesh's quest for immortality and reaching the gods. The tablet describes Ishtar's attempt to seduce Gilgamesh and her rejection. The gods grant her revenge and allow her to use a divine weapon against Gilgamesh and Enkidu. It was destroyed, however, by Gilgamesh and Enkidu. Enkidu is condemned to death in Tablets 7 and 8, where the gods decide someone must pay. A long eulogy is delivered by Gilgamesh. The Sumerian Noah, Utnapishtim, is portrayed in Tablet 9 as Gilgamesh's grandfather. As he approaches the mountains of Moshu, Stinging weapons are seen on the guards. His status as semi-divine is immediately recognized and allowed to pass. Passing through a tunnel, he reaches the city of Baalbek, a world of bright crystal. He is turned down by Shamash. Tablet 10 begins with a meeting with Siduri, the so-called barmaid, who instructs him on making the perilous trip across the seas of death. Many scholars believe that Siduri is another name for Ishtar, explaining its place in the epic. At the cost of becoming her lover, she helps him reach Utnapishtim. The punting poles, or fuel rods Gilgamesh needs for this trip, are only used once and then discarded. A spaceship appears to be orbiting his grandfather who he reaches. The deluge story is told to him by Utnapishtim in Tablet 11. A magic plant will rejuvenate Gilgamesh since he cannot be granted immortality. When Gilgamesh returns to Uruk with it, it is stolen by a snake. This Tablet 12 completely breaks the story. Enkidu is alive and about to enter the Netherworld. It is based on the Enkidu and the Netherworld myth. A hero's epic is a composite or selected collection of his experiences. Many stories relate to the Gilgamesh epic in some way. 
Several have been found in fragmentary forms such as Gilgamesh, the Bull of Heaven, and Gilgamesh's death. It is possible to reconstruct Gilgamesh's exploits by combining the various stories. Even though he was born semi-divine, he feared he was not immortal. It could only be granted by the gods, so he sought to reach them. To create his companion, the gods take a primitive man and put him through a civilizing process of sexual activity with the goddess, 